So uh, with uh, <coughs> Stephen not being here, they asked me to give a, a third talk. And I thought something that would be very interesting to the group would be sort of my views on how you detect prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew gave a very nice presentation on PSA screening, so I'm going to try not to revisit any of the things that he discussed, uh, though there may be a little bit of overlap. These are my disclosures. None of them have anything to do with this talk in any way, shape, or form. So there are a lot of different tests out there. There really are. It's overwhelming. Okay, And this tells me two things. One, there's a huge need. Patient presents with an elevated PSA, and you're trying to figure out how to manage them. A lot of different products out there. The second thing it tells me is that none of these are a clear winner, because otherwise we'd only have one. So when you're evaluating these tests and deciding what to do, you need to think of what your goals are in that individual patient. Okay, uh, Your goal is to identify men in need of diagnosis, and at the same time, decrease the number of unneeded biopsies and treatment. We don't want to overtreat our patients. Better not to discover the Gleason 6 cancer than decide not to treat it. Uh, and still biopsy and treat the patients in need. So I always like to think about this in terms of uh, you know, a, a patient. So a 65-year-old male, he gets his first PSA is 4.7, and then you repeat it and it's 4.9. So this is an important point. We, as urologists in general, most of the patients I see have a nice, you know, series of PSAs. It's not a single PSA. But if you see someone out of the blue which has an elevated PSA, repeat it. I mean, they, there's a whole host of things that could have jacked it up. It's a nice study that's now almost 20 years old from uh, uh, Memorial uh, that basically showed that about uh, 25 to 50 percent of these patients on a repeat PSA would be normal. Uh, the uh, no symptoms, he's got no symptoms, consistent with a urinary tract infection or recent instrumentation. Uh, and uh, he asked, hey, can I skip the biopsies? I don't want a biopsy. And here is where that goal comes in again. For this guy, who's 65 years old, do you, still, do you want to identify him as somebody who can safely avoid a biopsy? And an MRI and a biomarker can be very useful in this space. So MRI is central to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. I mean, I think that goes without saying. I don't think you need to come to, uh, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in order to hear that. Uh, this is one of the uh, older studies, uh, the precision trial, 500 men that were randomized to an MRI-targeted biopsy versus a standard biopsy due to an elevated PSA. What we can see over here is the pyreds, uh, threes, fours, and fives have an increasing likelihood in red of having clinically significant prostate cancer defined as Gleason 7 and above. And uh, if you did an MRI biopsy, you'd disco discover about 38 percent of these men uh, had Gleason 7 and above. And if you just did a standard biopsy, not having a target, it would only be about 26 percent. So clearly a win. The PROMISE trial was a little different. This is a trial in which they went ahead and took the same patients, and they did an MRI-guided biopsy, they did a truss biopsy, and they did a saturation biopsy. And the reason they did a saturation biopsy was to get as close to truth as possible. I mean, the problem is you don't know what you're missing. Uh, the MRI biopsy, 18 percent uh, more likelihood to, to, to identify significant cancers, and they'd avoid about 27 percent of the biopsies if they were negative. I think this is an important, uh, in my opinion, the most important table in the paper because it has the sensitivity and, spec and the negative predictive value. So the sensitivity would mean if they had cancer, what's the likelihood you would find it 88 percent of the time? And again, by cancer, I mean Gleason 7 and above. That means 12 percent of the time you'd miss it, which is a pretty high number. And the negative predictive value is 76 percent, meaning that, again, viewing it the other way, you'd miss about 24 percent of the tumors. So what our group did was a meta-analysis uh, of 72 MRI studies, uh, 36,000 patients. Uh, multiple factors were examined beyond simply the MRI, what their age was, what their ethnic background was, DRE, PSA, et cetera. And the endpoint we were interested in was Gleason 7 and higher. And PIRADS 4 and 5 still were associated with an increased risk of Gleason 7 prostate cancer, but not Gleason pattern 3. Uh, and uh, the, the PSA density, which I think is going to become increasingly important in evaluating MRIs, uh, was very strongly associated. So if we do the same sort of analysis we did before, and we use the PSA density of either 0.1, less than 0.1, or 0.15, now you have a sensitivity of 97% uh, and a negative predictive value of 94%, and you're going to avoid biopsying about 30% of these patients. And even if you use the more conventional 0.15, still a sensitivity of 95%, a negative predictive value of, negative, of 93%, and you'll have a biopsy reduction of, of 48% which is uh, pretty striking. So in my practice now, uh, I use this 
extensively in terms of counseling patients. There's still some patients with a high PSA density, excuse me, a low PSA density that are nervous and you end up uh, 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 biopsying them. But this is very reassuring to both me and the patient. So there are a lot of serum-based tests. <clears throat> So the, the, the granddaddy of them all was PSA health index. Uh, using these PSA derivatives, uh, you, you don't have to memorize them because it's going to come up over and over again, but it's the same PSA derivatives that are used over and over again. A low value uh, is good. Uh, a high value is bad. Okay? So this is a study uh, that uh, Bill Catalona did that got it FDA approved. Roughly uh, 900 men, no history of prostate cancer, normal rectal exam, PSA between 2 and 10, and this is going to be important as we go through these. All of these are supplemental to PSA testing. They're not instead of PSA testing. 25% uh, of the patients had prostate cancer, and a high score was associated with increased risk of disease. So uh, there's no cut point in which they don't have any risk of prostate cancer. And in this study, we're talking about any prostate cancer, including Gleason pattern 6. But if you accepted this threshold of, of, uh, of, of 25, you'd avoid biopsying about 25% of the patients. A more recent study that, that I participated in, uh, which was, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, we haven't got to that, excuse me. Uh, this is a, 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 a second study, uh, which I was not involved in, uh, where they had uh, took, looked at men who had no history of prostate cancer, normal rectal exam, the same PSA threshold. They had an initial cohort and a validation cohort, and they found that the score was associated with increased risk of aggressive, or again, defined as Gleason 7 prostate cancer. So this is the primary court, this is the, the validation court, and pretty much all for these, all these different uh, uh, five values, you see an increased risk of disease. But importantly, if you had a, a score of less than 20 in both the initial cohort and the validation cohort, very unlikely you're going to have Gleason 7 prostate cancer. So again, correlates with risk of disease, correlates with risk of aggressive disease, and, and you can use it in your clinic. It works pretty well. Uh, the 4K score uh, is another one. Uh, a very similar panel of markers, also a blood test, though now they incorporate things like age, digital rectal exam, and, 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 uh, and previous biopsy status. So they use a little bit of the prior information in order to improve the, the ability of their test to, to, to uh, detect disease. I think the best, one, best study to look at this is now almost a decade old. Uh, they looked at the PROTECT st study. This is a study from Europe where they randomized men to, we all think about it in terms of the part of the study where they randomized them to treatment, surgery, radiation, or active management. But leading into that was a rather large study uh, which was looking at screening. Uh, and so uh, 10 core biopsy, we can get an argument of whether that's uh, important or not. The more, more, more biopsy is better. Obviously, no MRIs. But they modeled the, the test, and then they validated it. And, and what they found is that if, in, this, in this figure, if you, if you biopsied everybody, you'd biopsy 1,000 men in order to detect 133 can high-grade cancers, again, Gleason 7 and above. But if you had a, a threshold of 6, okay, you'd only have to biopsy about 60% of the men. And you still detect the vast majority of high-grade cancers, uh, 119 out of the 133. Urine-based tests. PCA3 is probably the most important. Uh, discovered, I believe, in Hopkins uh, back in the 1990s by Murray and Pussmacher. I always like saying that name. Uh, and uh, it's a ratio. It's not a protein. Yeah, they do, you do an aggressive digital rectal exam, and it's a ratio of the mRNA of PCA3 to PSA. And a low value is good, a high value is bad. Pretty simple. And importantly, it's independent of prostate volume, age, BPH, and prostatitis. So this is a study that I was involved in run by John Way, a multi-institutional study involving 11 different centers, almost 1,000 men, uh, and uh, about 500, it was the initial biopsy, about 300 a repeat, and a very similar cancer identification rate of about, about 30%. So for the different PSA strata, less than 4, 4 to 10, and greater than 10, okay, as you increase the PCA3, you are more likely to identify not only prostate cancer, but aggressive prostate cancer. So if you look out here, a PCA3 of greater than 60 with a PSA of greater than 10, you have almost, and notice I say almost, 100% likelihood of detecting Gleason platinum 7 or above, whereas if you have a PSA of less than 4 and a low PCA3, I'm not sure exactly why these patients were being biopsied, but uh, a rather low value. Not zero, but a rather low value. So FDA approved, correlates with increased risk of disease, increased risk of aggressiveness, and a low PCA3 potentially can be spared a biopsy. 
So this is a, a, a newer test uh, ec, ep, uh, called Epi or actually ExoDX as well. Uh, so our body sheds little fragments of our cells all the time. And they get out into this, our fluids, into our serum, into our blood, uh, into our urine, into our bile, and you can detect these. And you can see what's actually in the cells. And the idea behind this study is these cells, if they're from cancer cells, would have little fragments of genes that could label them as cancer cells. So uh, interestingly, importantly, uh, PCA3 was in the mix here, but they also looked at two other genes. Again, correlated with Leeson pattern 7 and above. It gets a little boring after a while. Uh, it showed a lot of Kaplan-Meier curves before, now they're all ROC curves. Uh, but uh, the two cohorts they looked at, uh, importantly, not patients who never had a prior biopsy. And the important thing here is PSA is this one right here along the edge, just better than chance. This, this would be a, a test that didn't work as all, at all. And the EPI test or the EPI plus some, uh, 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 some uh, clinical information uh, outperforms, uh, you know, things like the PCPT calculator, uh, PSA alone, et cetera. And if you had a threshold of 15.6, you'd avoid about 20, 26% of the biopsies. And importantly, you would only miss about 7% of the Gleason pattern 7 and greater, and only about 1% of the Gleason 4 plus 3, the grade group 3 patients or higher, the ones that we really worry about. Uh, this is select MDX, a similar story, uh, looking at slightly different mRNAs, uh, a rather large cohort. Uh, and I think you remember these numbers here, because later on we're going to talk about some rather large cohorts, about 1,000 patients in each. Uh, again, similar story, right down to the fact that the ROC curve for the select MDX uh, outperforms the PCPT calculator. That's the figure down here. So the, the latest one is the, is the My Prostate Score 2. Uh, it was originally called the MIPS study, uh, two-gene model. Uh, MIPS-2 has, now has 18 genes plus clinical data, and the MIPS-2 plus incorporates prostate volume. Remember earlier I said how important that was, so now they're incorporating that into their, into their uh, algorithm. Uh, similar size studies, uh, looking at the usual sort of uh, uh, parameters. And uh, this is a, a, an interesting ROC curve. So not only did they compare it to PSA, which is down here, okay, and the, P, and the, uh, uh, the MIPS scores are out here at the best, but they incorporated some of the other studies that we're interested in. So the phi score, select MDX, XODX. The reason I have an approximation sign here is this was not the commercially available uh, 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 a test. This was done in their own labs. So take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But what I like about this study is they're attempting to look at multiple different uh, biomarkers to tell you which is the best one. I don't think it's surprising that theirs turned out to be the best because you tend to be a positive positive publication bias. And I think these are important studies as we try and evaluate which one is going to be the best for our patients. So this is a, an interesting meta-analysis uh, that looked at 49 different studies and examined exactly the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the markers that I sort of outlined in, in, in my talk so far. And they compared sensitivity, specificity, negative positive predictive value, and something called diagnostic odds ratio, which is an attempt to try and figure out which one's best for all of these different important parameters. So you have sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value for all the different, all the different studies. Obviously, all the different figures, are, the numbers are over here. But the important thing is I think they really cluster together. It's hard to pick out one that's best. I mean, maybe PCA3 is worse for specificity. You know, maybe PCA3 and 4K score are worse when you're looking at positive predictive value. You know, maybe the 4K score is best when you're looking at negative predictive value, but it's hard to look at these and say one of them is clearly better than the others. And if you look at diagnostic odds ratio, they really cluster, uh, you know, they cluster extensively. Uh, again, maybe PCA3 is a little worse than the others. Now, I'm talking about biomarkers, but they don't happen in isolation anymore. I mean, we get MRIs on all these patients, right? So. What's the order? How do we do this? Do we get an MRI and then a biomarker? Do you get a biomarker and then, and, then, and then an MRI? So this is a study which basically looked at all of the different possible ways that you could, not all of them, but multiple different ways that you could possibly integrate these. Uh, so I'm just going to highlight a few of them, okay? So this is my algorithm, which I'm not saying is right, okay? I get an MRI. If the biopsy is positive, I go ahead and do a biopsy. If it's negative, I get a 4K, and if the biopsy, and I'm not endorsing 4K. I mostly like 4K because I think they're, the way that they, the, the, uh, 
the documentation they produce, you can hand to a patient, the patient understands it, where some of them they don't. Uh, and I biopsy if elevated. The problem with that is I'm going to only miss 1% of the high grade cancers, but I'm going to have to, I'm only going to not biopsy 7% of the patients. Maybe algorithm one would be better, which is to reverse them. Okay, do the 4K score and then do the MRI and only biopsy if both are elevated. Then I would miss 10% of the cancers, but I would avoid biopsying about 40% of the patients. This is a recent study that did exactly that. And remember how I said, oh, big study, 500 patients, 1,000 patients. They looked at 45,000 patients uh, and uh, 15,000 who were screened. And what they did is if the PSA was elevated, then they went ahead and got a 4K score. If the 4K score is elevated, then they got an MRI. And, if the M and I like how they incorporate PSA density in there. And if the MRI was positive, then they did a biopsy. And uh, this is sort of their algorithm. And the important thing is only about 10% of the patients had an elevated PSA. About 70% of those had an elevated 4K score. So you could argue, well, maybe we don't even need to do that. About half of the patients end up getting biopsied, and about half of the patients end up finding, being found to have a high-grade cancer. But if we look at all the numbers together, you realize that to detect 2% of the cancers, you can drive it down so you're not biopsying very many people. Okay, you eliminate 65% of the biopsies. Now, the primary endpoint of the study, importantly, is mortality, and that's to be determined. But I think this is the kind of study that's really going to be illuminating to us how we're going to go ahead and, and manage patients in the future. So the patient got an MRI, demonstrated no lesions. Again, as I said, my four, I get a 4K score. Again, I'm not endorsing that particular, it's just what I happen to use. Uh, I think it's interesting that patients would rather have another blood draw than have a second rectal exam. Uh, and... Uh, uh, biopsy was performed, he was found out at least in seventh cancer. So I, I didn't go into this, but I think, you know, we all know PSA is flawed. It's a great marker. I absolutely love it. My, I, I think our patients are better cared for for it having existed. But is it perfect? Absolutely not. And I think more importantly, risk assessment is flawed. So what's your goal in this particular patient? If you're seeing an 80-year-old guy who's got a PSA of 4.5 and you're wondering why the hell did somebody get a, get a, uh, get a, uh, get a PSA on this guy, your goal is not to biopsy him. Okay? And sometimes you don't even need a biomarker. You can talk him out of it just on the basis of the fact that he's not going to benefit from any treatment. It's hard to do that over and over again, particularly when the guy comes back a year later and now his PSA is 4.8 because his intern has checked it again. Your goal is to avoid a biopsy. And another guy who's, you know, 50 years old, your goal is to try and find out what's going on. I didn't present the data, but we, we've done work where we found that if a patient has a PSA of over 1, the odds ratio of him dying of prostate cancer during his lifetime is roughly 10 times that of the general population. So slight elevations of PSA are really important in young patients. Don't order too many tests. Back in the day, I'd have patients come in, and I'm not making this up, they'd have like three MRIs, they'd have gotten a 4K score, uh, uh, a... Uh, 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 a uh, a phi score, uh, making this up a little bit, but multiple different things. Many of them had sequenced their own DNA, okay? That's what it's like living in Boston as opposed to Jacksonville. Maybe in Jacksonville they do this as well. Uh, not Jacksonville, uh, Jackson Hole. And then they'd say, what does it mean? And all the tests would tell you something different. So you'd say, I don't know, there's too much noise, okay? So don't order too many tests. Pick the one that you trust that works for you and then just stick with it. Thank you very much.